what browser stack did was uh, five years old. Uh, the playbook was done 10 years before from India, and this was done by a 17 year old guy named Pallav Nadani, who's the next startup showcase that I want to invite. And, uh, you know, the product that he built was used by the top man on the planet. And I will not steal Pallav's thunder and I'll let him speak more about fusion charts. And uh, in, in the meanwhile, can I invite Gaurav and uh, Ezra to come back onto the stage again? Thank you, Rajan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Pallav Nadani and I run a company called Fusion Charts. And normally when you have data in the first slide of your presentation, half of the room goes digging into their phone and the other half sleeping. But I hope the coffee will keep you up and if I can borrow seven minutes of your time, I'll make it worthwhile. So we help software companies build data visualization within their product. So it's like charts, graphs, widgets, dashboards. And we've got about 26,000 customers in the world uh, who use our product. So you might be asking, really, somebody pays for charts? Uh, yes, they do. 26,000 customers who are our enterprises. Why? Number one, we make it work everywhere. Whether it's your phone, whether it's your tablet, whether it's your old device, your old browsers. And when I'm talking about old browsers, I'm talking about IE. 20% of China is old IE, 6% of US is old IE. And if you're running an enterprise company and your data visualization doesn't work because your new age developer doesn't want to work with those things, well, your business user will be at a loss. And not only that, when we build these products, we keep developer at the center of the mind and ensure that he doesn't have any learning curve at all. So in that sense, he can get started with our product in 15 minutes and in a couple of hours, deliver great data visualizations for your product. So as I said, we have got about 26,000 customers. Uh, about half of them are in the US. Uh, the rest of the uh, customers are in uh, the other 117 countries in the world, uh, Europe, Asia. Uh, heck, we even got a uh, customer in Greenland. I did not know they had computers in Greenland. <laughs> and we got 700,000 developers across the world who use our product. And we've been at it for a while. So, um, and our profits are in millions of dollars every year. That's not the revenue. Again, it's the profits which uh, we've been uh, building on top of that. And you might say, you know what? Everybody has charts. There's open source. There are a whole bunch of libraries. Um, every product has a dashboard. And yes, we agree. Why? Because that's already been there, done that. And while we are innovating at that, you know what's new? Mobile. Smartwatches. When was the last time you guys actually consumed data visualization effectively on a mobile? Anyone? You know what mobile is great at? If you see somebody on a subway holding the rails or an Uber, it's great for video, with audio, with a narrative of your data, insights. And we've built a platform that converts all your data in real time to videos with narrative audio, live charts, live graph, and integration with workflow systems. Now coming to workflow systems, typically if you think of an enterprise product or any other business product, you've got a workflow system where people go and enter their data. Whenever they need to think, they go to a dashboard tool and the context gets lost. Why should that happen? Why can't that context be provided within the workflow tool? So we've been building platforms which brings those things inside your workflow tool. And these are some of the things that we're trying to do new. Um, in terms of our target market, so while we talked about 26,000 customers, we've got about 2,000 ISVs, which is software companies who use our product in the OEM model. But there are about 120,000 ISVs in the world who we have not gone to. And we want to ensure that every single data visualization which is being built in any product is powered by us. And that's just not charts and graphs, but videos, infographics, diagrams, uh, smart farms, all of that. And there are potentially 18 million developers who could use our product. And talking in terms of customers, so enterprises like CA and Ariba, which is a SAP company, majority of their products internally use our product. And I'll talk about a specific case study, Microsoft Power BI. Have you guys heard of that? So it's what they are touting it as a Tableau killer. So Microsoft has a great team. They have all the bandwidth in the world to go out and build it on their own. And they did start with that. But why did they come and partner with us? A, we are extremely good at what we do. Probably we know more about IE678 VML than Microsoft itself does. And that's the internal joke in the company, which we have found by experimentation. So we built data visualizations which are extremely useful, extremely meaningful, engaging, and works across devices. And it's not just one way, hey, you know what, see a chart and consume, but it's a two-way interaction. And which is why we partnered with Microsoft and we're powering some of their visualizations on Power BI. And these are some of the logos, about 85% of Fortune 500 companies already use our product. 
So, uh, well, Rajan talked about the most powerful man using our product. This was part of US government website, which was inaugurated by President Obama. And uh, we were lucky to get a photo of that. Well, I'm still uh, not sure do I want the next one to use it, but this photo is still going to be there. <laughs> and uh, we've been lucky to be on the Forbes India cover and hoping to be on the Forbes US cover as well sometime in the future. And we got a bunch of awards in competent categories in Deloitte, Fast Growth, um, CNBC, Emerging India Awards, um, and that keeps continuing. So what's next for us? The way we look at it is data is growing. Screen size real estate is getting smaller. The attention span is getting smaller. How do you convert data narrative in a useful way, not just to business users? Think about users of MailChimp, who's an average indie seller. This guy also needs to learn from his data, but he's not going to go look at a dashboard because he's not savvy around that. Can you deliver it in a video with an audio? And we're not just talking English. We're talking vernacular languages here, which will come into the picture. How do we ensure people don't get scared of data, but they actually meaningfully use data? How do we get to all of those 120,000 ISVs? Who will use our libraries? That's our aim. So this is our three-year plan. And um, my ask from you, if any of you are building a platform company where data is an important part and you want your customers to have more effective experiences around data, come talk to us. If you are an ISV where data, data experience is going to be a differentiator, come talk to us. If you are a BI and you want a differentiation in this commoditized category, come talk to us. I'm available for the whole day, and thank you for your time. If you distill down what, because um, that's impressive, all the accomplishments and progress you've made, what are the core competencies of your company that, that enable all this? Is it mobile? Is it data analytics? Is it visualization? What are the things that you feel you're really good at? So it's an intersection of anything we can do within a browser and our understanding of how humans should fundamentally consume data. And, and in terms of anything you can do inside of a browser, does that mean sort of distilling information to the thing that comes to mind is sort of small size of visualization? Is that, so is the skill set being able to help you identify what things really matter? Or what is the skill set inside of that capability? Or is it just making stuff small? Sure. So it's not just making stuff small. So if you look at, we have five sensory organs. And our eye processes the maximum amount of data. It's 2 GB per second. How do you use the maximum bandwidth that you have, which is visualization, to help you understand the chart and the data? And the chart is like a painting. The, the view of the user flows within the chart. How do you ensure he's looking at the right part of the chart at the right time, getting the right insights? So there's a lot of research which goes be, uh, behind that. So it's a combination of from data to presentation within the browser, how much can we stretch? And how can we experiment around that? You have a pretty impressive list of customers. Uh, can you talk a bit about your sales model, how long it takes to get them on board? And when you go to these customers, do you, who do you generally compete with, and how do you sort of differentiate against some of the bigger players like Tableau and others? Sure. So I'll take this in two parts. So we are a completely India-based company. We've got 70 people, and we've got partner network around the world. So we do online marketing, take part in trade shows, uh, but the, all the sales team is inside sales driven. And we close them typically from a lead to conversion is about 39 days. Uh, typically, we go to product managers with the large companies. In smaller cases, the developers. Uh, we do not compete with Tableau. Tableau sells to business users. We are like the guys providing the shovels to the companies. We don't dig for the gold, which is why our target focus is ISVs. And, and who is, what, some examples, there's great um, uh, names of companies. What are some of the actual use cases, like where your product is really valuable, where you've seen a business be able to uh, uh, do something they couldn't do before or enable some decisions that weren't being made before. What are some examples of some great use cases of the platform? Sure. So I'll take an example of JDA software, which is into supply chain management. Now, supply chain management visualization could get very complex, and you cannot use your standard bar, column, pie charts. So using some of our advanced domain-specific charts, they're able to visualize the entire support chain, create an interactive model on top of that, where that visualization itself became the workflow system. So that's one example which helped them save millions of dollars. Uh, five of the top 10 BI companies, their entire presentation layer is powered by us. So when they get implemented in the customer premises, all the visualizations are powered by us. And just the icing on the cake, when their sales guys go and showcase this to, let's the potential buyers, it's a great sale. Because when you're selling BI, you start with the visualization layer. Can you give us a sense of your customer base? How much is sort of larger enterprise versus uh, you know, the small, medium businesses who are using it? And where do you see the growth coming forward? 
So 70% of our revenue is ISV business. Typically, these are customers who are at least paying $5,000 a year, goes up to half a mil. Uh, the long tail of the market is going to open source. We don't serve that at all. So we're looking at mid-market to enterprise market where companies have multiple products. We do deep integration with them. But that being said, for example, Coca-Cola, a bunch of their internal dashboards uses our product because the standard stuff does not work for them. And some of these big companies, they have internal analytics team where they want to build these dashboards, have them serve on mobile, have them sent out to vendors where Tableau does not scale. So two a uh, few seconds left, two questions. How do you charge... And, and is this product pretty sticky? Do you, do you have high retention of people once they've adopted it, continuing to use it? So I'll take it reverse. So our average ISV contract life cycle is five years. The only reason they drop out is they shut the product or they shut the company. Uh, how do we charge? For an ISV per product per year. Uh, for the retail market, based on number of developers per year. Cool. Well, they should never shut the company if they have such a good insights. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good job. So uh, back when I ran uh, product management for uh, global QuickBooks, now one of the painful lessons that I learned is uh, in the enterprise world, there is this adage that, you know, custom requests are a death by a you know, thousand cuts. But in the SMB world, it is a death by a hundred thousand cuts. So the next company that I'm going to introduce adds another dimension of complexity, but are still, you know, rocking in the global SMB space. Krish of ChargeV is going to ex explain how he's doing it. My name is Krish. I'm one of the uh, co-founders and CEO of ChargeB. At ChargeB, we help recurring revenue businesses manage their subscription complexity and invoicing. My co-founders worked in Zoho from the time uh, they had installable network management systems, building various products, and then transitioned into building several SaaS products. And then we started ChargeB, and that's how we stumbled upon the problem. So what ChargeB is attempting to do is that is what Stripe and Braintree did in the payment space. So Stripe made the took the complexity out of the API when it comes to payments, and then using a, an elegant API, they were able to make it extremely easy for developers to integrate. And in ChargeB, we are making it extremely simple for developers to forget about how to manage subscriptions, how to forget about the complexity of building, invoicing, all the boring pieces. We just help automate all those aspects and make it extremely easy for them to connect and build on top of ChargeB. So with what makes it complex, right? When somebody is launching a product and then you are launching a new recurring revenue uh, business, you start off with most of the time, 95% of the time, uh, companies start off with some kind of an in-house solution that is built on top of payment gateways. And then it gets unwieldy because the developers think I'm building a recurring credit card billing, uh, or I want a way uh, I want a way to just charge a customer. And then at some point it becomes really unwieldy, where it becomes more and more complex. And the maintenance is huge because these are not experts in finance, nor CRM systems, and they need to integrate this data because your core customer data cannot live in isolation. It needs to play along nicely with your existing CRM systems or your help desk system and your finance system, and then this data needs to uh, be tightly integrated into the workflows. And revenue recovery, where unpaid invoices, for especially for a business model like recurring revenue, where it's high velocity of people who are trying your product, and then you are charging thousands of customers every single month, the number of unpaid invoices, how do you recover payments, all that becomes a massive challenge. And those are problems that we address with ChargeB. Right now, we serve more than 3,000 customers around the world. Many SaaS businesses, IoT, many of the emerging IoT businesses, and interestingly, e-commerce subscription businesses. Freshdesk, when they started off with us, they had a few hundred customers with an internal building system. And we have scaled with them to 100,000 plus customers now and took the complexity out of the entire building process by having an integrated system. Goa Pass is a very interesting case. So it's a 20-member team when they reached out to us with a presence in five countries, five different currencies, and uh, building a subscription recurring revenue business. And we helped our partner Stripe to win Goa Pass. And with a single developer, we were able to migrate the customer in four weeks. The entire billing process was migrated into ChargeB. 
And now, every time they roll out to a new country, they don't touch the code at all. Right? Now, the marketing team imagines a pricing problem and says, OK, now we are going to launch in Vietnam, and then now what's the currency that, is, that I need to launch, and what are all the different payment methods that I want? And then they just enable it and charge me because these are all pre-integrated. And now, they also launch these in a single day without any developer involvement. And that's what we actually bring to our customers. So what exactly is the solution? It's a typical boring billing and invoicing problem. right? But what makes it interesting is uh, how much is packaged or abstracted in terms of complexity. So we take care of all the security compliance aspects. We are PCA days as level one compliant. We also have uh, take care of the EU safe harbor, which has morphed into privacy shield. And then every day, in some part of the world, we see tax compliance changing. Right? New Zealand has launched a, a model which is very similar to EUAT. And then in different parts of the world, now that is a model that is being followed. Now we just take care of all these things as business rule configurations inside the system. And then of course, there is the analytics that is very relevant for the subscription businesses that needs to bubble up. And that is another aspect dimension of charge V, where we uh, bring up the relevant metrics. Now, what is the real market? We started off focusing on developers' happiness. And now we understand that it is now becoming our job to actually delight the most ignored guys in most companies, which is the finance team. Right? Well, no developer actually says, goes into office and says, OK, OK, what, what can I solve for you? Right? We are worried about the customer's problem. But the internal team gets ignored, and those are our customers that we actually focus on. In pretty much every one of these markets, that is mostly the case. So we have customers in pretty much all of these verticals, most dominantly in SaaS. And what makes us relevant in our customer context is that, OK, so there is SAP, there is Oracle. Why is it that Schneider Electric is actually not using one of these systems when they are launching a new product stream? Right? Many of these businesses are trying to reinvent themselves by trying to launch new product streams, new revenue streams. Now, what makes us relevant is we fit into their worldview of problems. A developer sitting inside any of these big companies is thinking, now, I need to make sure that I have one of these approved payment partner that will accept payments. I know that. I know that our system uses either QuickBooks, Zero, or SAP, or Oracle, and I need my data to go in there. And I have my CRM, which is Salesforce, that needs to work with. But how do I make all of this possible? It's, and, but, and yet, I want to be able to enjoy working with a, an API that is actually Stripe-like. Maybe Stripe is not allowed in their company. But we make every payment gateway smarter, better, by providing this layer. And that is what makes Charge be affordable. And we start in a price point where it's contextual for that customer at a time that they are starting with us. And then we grow with them. Now, this is what makes us extremely happy, where we put smiles in people's faces while building out and solving a boring problem. And in the context of our customer, what we learned more and more is that the more integrated we are in their workflow, we are more relevant. And I would really love to learn more about how we can, we can have conversation with the CRM help desk and the finance teams uh, of our potential customers, and how can we grow with you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the pricing model is a typical SaaS pricing model. It starts at $99, $199, $399 and above. So from the, when you need custom pricing, so in the early days when they are launching product, most of the time you know your price to your customer, but you do not know how many customers you are going to get. So we start off small with us, and then we keep growing with them. It's more of a land and expand. And then, so from charge perspective, there is SaaS revenue, and then there is a platform fee which we partner with the payment gateways. So there are two revenue streams for charge B itself. From a customer churn perspective, uh, when we start off with a lot of early stage companies, of course, in one and a half, two years, if there is experimentation, then we see a churn of like 1.3 percentage on a monthly basis with the early stage companies. But when they start making money, it's extremely sticky. Right? Um, and from a revenue churn perspective, it's a net negative. Because the ones who expand actually compensate for everybody else who's actually churning out. In terms of uh, the people coming on and using the platform, I love the idea of sort of enabling subscription models and taking advantage of that trend in the market. Are you normally seeing people who are launching new products, either new companies or new products in companies? Or are you identifying products that, uh, that are subscription models that maybe are inefficiently run and trying to get them to go onto your platform? Where does most of your growth come from? Right. Uh, the 95% of the market is pretty open with internal systems. So we actually migrate a lot of customers 
help them transition their internal building intelligence and then decouple that from their messy hairball that they have internally with their application logic and the billing, everything becomes complex, then you cannot do pricing experimentation and all that. And that is one of the reasons. The moment they launch a product and then they have one pricing working and then they are thinking marketing comes and says, okay, now I need to be able to change the price. Now what do you do? And then this becomes a nuisance for them to be able to cater to internal marketing needs, sales needs and all that, and then we help migrate them. So that's about 20% of our customers where we continuously migrate from their internal systems. But the, the, we also did a freemium tier with, which is very similar to what Braintree did in the early days. Uh, and that has worked out to actually capture the imagination of early stage companies where you make your first experiment with your first $50,000 of revenue and get started. And then once it takes off, of course, you're going to stay with us. So that way, we were able to compensate for the churn and then help them actually be a friend of these companies which are trying to throw this idea out and then help them grow. And then we grow with that. I would imagine you're seeing a lot of subscription models uh, from a different, number of different companies and some of the nuances they have. Do you uh, give any advice to your clients and companies and users about how they can uh, have best practices for subscription models and maybe they're not experts in the model and how they really optimize it? Uh, do you help them at all from a consulting standpoint or expertise standpoint? Yeah, it's, it's like a vantage point, right? You're actually seeing some of the best products that are coming out in the recurring revenue business and we learn from our customers. And most of the time the conversation turns very interesting when the companies come on board, they actually want to know more about, okay, so how can you help us with the best practices, right? So the things like uh, the smart dunning that we implemented where we recover 20%, so if there is a $100 lost in the first transaction and you're trying to charge a customer, you don't want the customer leaving because of involuntary churn, right? So we actually try to implement some of these best practices baked into the product where we say, I can recover $25 for every $100 that goes into the failures. Um, so those are things that we bake in. And then we tell them that pretty much most B2B products that are getting launched, the businesses don't hesitate to put backup payment information, just like the way you would actually do that for Google AdWords, where you don't want your ads to stop at any time, so you are okay with saying, okay, here is my corporate card, here is the ACH direct debit, right? just don't stop the ads. Right? So we actually help them, okay, all the critical systems, maybe you can have pay backup payment methods, and we enable them. So one is bringing the best practices that we learn from our customers, and then baking into the product. The other one is about helping them do some of the experiments much better, which is uh, when you change your price, Make sure that it's grandfathered in for your existing customers because SaaS is all about subscriptions, all about trust and long-term relationships. So we, br we bring some of that through our customer success program, working closely with our customers. So you mentioned uh, one of your customers that approached you and generally what's your go-to-market strategy? Do you also consider working with some of the bigger payment players to sort of get customers, et cetera? Uh, right, we do. So the customer acquisition through the early days has been through inbound marketing, right? As a software engineer coming and then learning about difference between even marketing and sales, I actually pretty much consumed everything that HubSpot threw out, which has learned digital marketing, and that is how we built the entire pipeline. And we get like, we bring in thousands of leads through the inbound marketing channels. Uh, and most interestingly, the, the integrations with uh, Zero QuickBooks, and Salesforce, now that is opening up channels for us to be able to participate in these marketplaces, platforms, and help them succeed much better, because pretty much every customer that we work with already has a CRM system, already has a help desk system, or an accounting system. And it makes sense for us to be able to partner better with these companies and then help the solve the workflow. And that way they get to actually retain an early stage product that is getting launched and help them win. So that's another model where we are seeing we get more promising high value customers coming through these partner channels. Right, thanks so much.